I have two quick questions, if you don't mind. I think you can answer them both sure. swiftly. The first is, if you were asked, if you were called on behalf of a def uh, defendant, uh, say an American soldier who was partic participant in torture, would you testify on his behalf and explain what you explained tonight? And the second one is, today the first, the, the best-selling drugs, uh, pharmaceuticals, are yeah, antidepressants and anti-ulcer medications. 30 years from now, will there be a pharmacological solution, prospectively, to what you're talking about? Uh, thanks for those questions. I think it would be difficult if a soldier were on trial. And this, by the way, Z Philip Zimbardo does testify uh, with the Abu Ghraib hearings, for example, about situational dynamics. And maybe I would do so, too, because I think it's important. The fact is, it's hard to say somebody should be exculpated just for that reason. So I wouldn't want to jump in and say they should just be let off the hook. But part of the judicial system is to say, look, if we put people in the right sorts of situations, can they be reintegrated into society and do the right thing? So I would try to push things towards that direction. Um, as far as pharmaceuticals of the future, I mean, I'm not really that big a fan of pharmaceuticals in the, in the first place. So um, I thought you were going to ask something about ADHD drugs or something, because those are, you know, I mean, one of the most prescribed, I mean, everybody's on speed. I don't know if it's the same here, but in, in America, all the kids are, are on speed. So anyway, um, <laughs> your question, I guess, was would you use pharmaceuticals to try to change people in the situation. I'm sort of a libertarian, so I don't like the idea ever of a government being able to muck with the biology of its citizens. So I would never be in favor of any sort of pharmacological intervention by authority figures. So I'm just thinking about how you can apply syndrome E with things like maybe eating and wearing animals. Um, people compartmentalize. Um, what's actually happening to animals before they eat them. You know, you buy a pack of ham in the supermarket, people just think that it's food, um, but actually a lot of suffering is going on there. Is that syndrome E, would you say? Um, I don't know if it's syndrome E in that it doesn't include things like the elation uh, about doing it and so on. The mm. difficult, so, so it's a very interesting question you're asking because the difficulty is knowing where to draw the line. So, so you might say, Look, animals have feelings too, which I, I agree with that totally. They have some degree of consciousness and so on. So you might say, how can people dehumanize animals? We should bring them up into this category. But you, one still has to draw a line in the sand, for example, about where you're going to eat. So what you're really addressing are societal and cultural norms. Um, I don't, it's... I don't, I don't mean like, you know, you, you know treating them with, uh, like they're humans. I mean, treating them with the, a modicum of of respect about how they physically feel after being tortured. You know, that's, that's the concern I'm sort of out Yeah, on. it's a very interesting question. I don't know what to say about it, except that I don't think it's exactly the same as Syndrome E, which is characterized by a sudden onset, like a group contagion, whereas the point you're raising, which is a good one, is that cultural norms have some relationship to that. But the thing that's special about Syndrome E is people acting in a normal, eusocial way, and then as a group, sort of contagiously switching over to this other kind of behavior where it's repetitive, it's, usually, it's always based on ideology. I don't think I put that on the list, but it's this ideological obsession with a bigger idea. It's this elation that's evol involved in cleansing a particular ethnic groups. So I think it's slightly different, but I take your point that there's a relationship there with cultural norms. Well, there was a, uh, a speech given to a group like this by Steven Pinker. He wrote a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And he also was a, is a neuropsychiatrist, I think. But would you agree he with, I have a couple of questions relating to, to uh, his book. Uh, and one is, would you agree with uh, progressive improvement from outrageously horrible towards somewhat less horrible over the uh, last couple of thousand years and, and even last 50 years, and uh, do you see reasons for uh, further optimism in some of the things that maybe that he's talked about in terms of behavior people? Thank you for that question. For those of you who haven't read Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, he makes these statistical arguments about how if you lived in the 1500s, even though we tend to retrospectively romanticize things, in fact, it was awful. Your lifespan would be short, your education would be terrible, your probability of dying of disease or warfare was much higher. And as we've gone along, things have just gotten better and better and better. Um, I think the argument is generally sound. Uh, there's another book by Matt Ridley called The Rational Optimist, which has a very similar 
uh, view on it. And so that's the good news. The bad news, of course, is that at the same time, um, we're developing better and better technologies for killing groups of people. And so, you know, 60 years ago with the Holocaust, that's not that long ago. I mean, it's very recent. And now our technology has developed so much, I can't take the Pinker and Ridley argument to say we're not going to have World War III, because we certainly might have World War III. All their argument is that, on average, if you sort of average over the 20th century, it's better than the 15th century and the 10th century and so on. But, but the point is that we've got this countervening effect of, of worse bombs. Have, have there been any tests run on people who actually have been educated about those effects, i.e. to check whether or not really as you point um, that we need to educate people about those syndromes? Is it, I mean, have you run tests where uh, peop, how people educated about those, you know, the banality of evil react to those tests? That's a terrific question. I, to my knowledge, those tests have not been done. Um, here's what happened in, in uh, when, when Milgram ran these experiments in the 1960s, you didn't need institutional review board approval from the ethics community at your university the way that you do now. So he was able to pull these off. Now it would be essentially impossible to run those experiments. But I think it's a shame because in answer to your point, I think we'd find that the compliance rate is much less now. Why? Because every psychology student reads about the Milgram experiment. And, and you, get this, you get this very healthy skepticism about, about authority figures. So I think the fact that it's part, actually, I'm just curious, how many of you had heard of the Milgram experiment? Yes, that's great. I mean, that's exactly what you want, is for everybody to know about it. It's part of the social dialogue. And then next time one's in that situation, you at least have an opportunity to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to go that direction. So the test hasn't been done, but I'm very optimistic about what the results would be. I have two questions. One is, can you apply this to behaviors that are less radical? So I'm hoping and imagining most people in this room haven't had to go through, you know, haven't had these sorts of behaviors. But I suspect we all have behaviors, whether it's in personal life or in business, where, you know, you treat people in a way which is not nice. Or if you take bullying and all these things in organizations, can you apply this? And if you can, how do you help people change those behaviors? And the second question, a bit related to the one that was just asked, have you seen what effect this might have if you go and teach this to people in gangs in Chicago? Does, how long does it take for the knowledge to alter the brain? And also, how long does it take to indoctrinate people to do these things? Okay, very good questions. Um, as far as how long it takes to indoctrinate people, historically, when you look at things like what happened with the Germans or the Turks or the... Uh, the Japanese with the Nanking massacre and so on, it's, it's actually a slow process. You marinate in this political culture for years and years where you see them as the enemy, you blame them for your problems, you have different uh, problems with some group of people. And so, so that seems to take a, a while to indoctrinate people. Um, it's an interesting question because what we're doing with the gangs in Chicago isn't about educating about you know, blind obedience to authority or something. Instead, it's just trying to stem violence by leveraging the things that we know about violence, like you'll do it in this social context, but you won't do it in this social context. Um, one of the guys who works with, he, he works on the street with the high-risk youth, um, you know, he was a former gang member himself, and he was just telling me, I was just in Chicago two days ago working on this, and he was saying how you know, he's got a nephew who's in prison who's very violent and aggressive, but the nephew will never act that way in front of him just because he respects him because he's the older uncle and so on. So somehow the social context absolutely changes the program that you're running. And that's all we're trying to do is leverage that aspect to figure it out. We're actually trying a couple of other interventions too. One of them is just this issue about interrupting and reframing. So, you know, some guy's car window gets broken and he says, I'm going to go kill the guy who did it. And so the idea is you get up in his face and you say, look, if you go do that and you end up in jail, who's going to be with your girl? And so he sort of, you know, thinks about it, makes him mad or whatever. But it's just a way of reframing the issue to, to try to help not act on impulses but have more long-term decision making. So there are various things we're doing there that's not based on, you know, education. It's based on... Um, uh, finding ways to leverage these things and get the emotional circuits back into gear, and so on. Was it, I hope I've, I, I, there was another part to your question I think I might have forgotten by now. 
Oh, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, the thing, the thing about something like Syndrome E is it's so different from the norm, and it's so horrific what people can do to each other that when somebody's just sort of acting badly in the workplace or communities, people are just a little bit mean or something, it's, it's almost like it's a different thing. It's not that they've completely dehumanized the other to the extent that they can murder them. Thinking a little bit about what's going on in the world right now, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, all the fun going on in Syria and whatnot. Uh, at a sort of more regional level, uh, you have this issue between um, Shia and Sunni and Alawites. If you had a magic wand, um, access to all the leaders, is there anything you would do or say, knowing what you know, that could shift things even slightly? Yes. Um, I think the first thing is, if one had all the resources to do so, I would do like the Six Nations of the Iroquois did, where I'd try to make sure that across the Shia and the Sunni and so on, there was some other cross-cutting thing that made them feel like, well, I don't really want to fight against that guy because he's also part of whatever. So to whatever extent you could try to tease out some other relationship, that helps to hold everything into balance, which is maybe the best you can hope for, is just to, just to hold the balance there. Um, there might be other interventional strategies. I think that when the, you know, when other countries say, if you respond with violence, we are going to impose sanctions on you, that's pretty similar to, to uh, uh, somebody in a gang whose grandmother says, if you do this violent act, I'm going to be really disappointed in you. Um, you know, maybe it's sort of the same issue, ostracism and so on, plugs into very basic neural circuits. In fact, just as a quick side note, if you're in physical pain, you know, I showed you there are particular areas that light up, it's the same if you're ostracized. Like, if you're the last guy picked for the basketball team, those same areas light up. So, uh, anyway, these are, uh, that would be the, the best hope that I could think of. How do you explain the uh, 35%? The 35% who did not go all the way up to 450 volts. Thank God there's that 35%. And those are the people we need to socially model. And those are the people who perhaps were raised in households where they were always asked to question authority. And, you know, even though we talk about these terrible events, what happened in Nazi Germany and in Nanking and so on, even there, there were always people who, who hid Jews, who took Chinese and helped them and so on. So, so thank goodness that those people exist. And our job really is to take that segment of the population and cultivate it and expand that. Thank you. Is uh, psychopathic behavior capable of modification? Very sadly, it turns out that there is no rehabilitative strategy for psychopaths at this time. Just so everybody's clear, a psychopath is somebody who, because of differences in their brain that are measurable, um, they don't care about you, they will, they're, you know, selfish and narcissistic, and they're trying to get what they want, and to, to, to them, you are a pawn on the chessboard, that they will go around, if they happen to be aggressive, they'll hurt you, things like that. Um, it's a very worrisome 1% of the population, and I should just mention, by the way, just to be totally clear, psychopaths are totally different than what happens in Syndrome E, because Syndrome E are, is essentially otherwise normal people who, because of this group contagion, can go and do these incredible things. Psychopaths are sort of the individual examples of that. Um, everybody's been trying to come up with rehabilitative strategies, and so far, not only do they not work, but one of the strategies was to put psychopaths in, in group therapy, where they get to sit with the victim's family and so on like that, and it turns out that when there was a follow-up study, it turns out it caused them to reoffend more. It made them worse, and the reason is they listened to people in the group therapy, and they thought, oh, I didn't know that when I said this, you would respond like that, so they actually got better at what they were doing. It's a question about neuroimaging and its relevance to the problems that we're talking about, which basically relate to behavior. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what the application is, because we know that when people's behavior change, obviously you have activity in different parts of the brain, and we can do correlational studies which, which can highlight which, which areas are involved when the behavior changes. But how can those neuroimaging studies actually inform how we ought to go about behaving and developing programs to change behavior? So let me, that's a great question. So let me give you an example of that. So I mentioned that what we were doing with the, with the empathy studies was coming up with a neural measure of in-group, out-group differentiation. Now, if I asked you, hey, would you care if a person of another religion got stabbed in the hand, you might say, 
I love all my brethren equally, right? So what you tell me is not necessarily what's actually happening in your brain. And what this gives us is an objective way to quantify different narratives of saying, okay, here are narratives that, are, that we've pulled from around the world that are involved in propaganda and dehumanization. Here are narratives that are involved in rehumanization, and we can measure the effect of those without having to ask the person to make up a story about it, because people will, will lie about that. I'm not a neuroscientist or a psychologist. I'm a, I'm a games programmer, and uh, I was just wondering, um, uh, we talked about dehumanization um, through interaction with uh, human beings directly or indirectly. Now, you talked about Anders Breivik trying to dehumanize himself through computer games. Now, what is your opinion? Um, how would it be that if a child is sort of playing lots of violent computer games, would, that be, would this dehumanization transfer over to reality? Thank you for that very important question. People have been running studies on this for years now, and the results seem to be that there's no causal relationship between playing violent video games and acting more aggressive or becoming dehumanized in this case. There's a strong correlation, which is that people who are real aggressive jerks will often play these games, <laughs> but, but if you play these six hours a day, it doesn't cause you to change anything that you are. So that's what seems to be the result, is there's no causative thing there. And actually, I'm not even sure that I believe, I mean, look, his statement was, I'm such a nice guy, everyone would describe me as caring and sympathetic. Bullshit. And then he says, you know, and so I went through this dehumanization strategy, and for him it was the video games plus this meditation. But who knows the, the extent to which we can believe his own narrative on that and whether the video games were, were a part of it in any meaningful way. I'm just wondering, in your view, where individual accountability lies on this spectrum? Because I guess it's a basic tenet of socialization that we sort of restrain our everyday impulses to, you know, get mad at people, hit people, rape and pillage, etc. So in giving a scientific basis to this, do you think we're not only diminishing responsibility, but then, you know, diminishing our expectations of people. We expect them to behave like sheep, then they're going to act like sheep. That's a very important question. The answer is no, it doesn't diminish individual responsibility at all. What it gives us is the tools to understand the systemic variables that cause situations like that. For better or worse, people who behave badly in Abu Ghraib prison or in any place else, um, they still do have to get punished for many reasons. Justice, it turns out, tries to accomplish many things at the same time. Uh, one of them is just slaking public bloodlust, setting up examples for the next people, and so on. So, so the people who commit these tortuous acts in prisons and so on have to get punished. But the importance of studying is not to let them off the hook. It's to try to prevent the next generation from doing it. Thank you very much. I'm going to be out in the lobby. I'll sign books. Thanks. <laughs>